I won't dawdle too long over my introduction. The art of beginning has always eluded me, compounded now by an edgy unease crawling up my spine. To preserve the identities of those involved, including myself, I'll be dealing in aliases and withholding certain particulars. But rest assured, I won't compromise the essence of the tale. You may call me Winston. In the sprawling labyrinth of the dark web, I found my sanctuary to cast my truths, hoping they would remain concealed in its impenetrable depths. It's a secret I've protected for twenty long years, and now a cocktail of fear and a desperate need for catharsis has pushed me to finally reveal it. A small town boy from Anchorage, Alaska, that was me. You might imagine Alaska as an endless frozen wasteland, but Anchorage, it's just like any other city, hemmed in by that icy expanse. Like a moth drawn to flame, I was enticed by the allure of military life at the tender age of 18. Fast forward a couple of years, and I found myself in 2003, based at Fort Greeley. The post-9-11 military atmosphere was peculiar, like a behemoth boxer recovering from an unexpected blow. It wasn't just the surge in enlistments, although that was notable. It was the stark shift in attitude. A paranoia had seized the military, like Mike Tyson publicly humiliated by a contemptuous slap. Under this climate, we were scrutinized ceaselessly to forestall another attack on home turf. This very atmosphere set the stage for the strange tale I'm about to share. On a seemingly ordinary day, April 17, 2003, military and civilian radars picked up an unknown object invading Alaskan airspace, which then reportedly crashed not far away from our base. Myself, along with ten other soldiers, were handpicked by our superiors for what was presented as a routine search and rescue mission. The aim? Locate the fallen object. But there were unsettling elements about this operation. Our briefing felt more like preparations for an impending war. I remember attributing this to the heightened sensitivities around aircraft incidents at the time. Looking back, I have my doubts. Then there was the curious addition of Hargrove, one of the base's high-ranking officers, to our ragtag band. Why dispatch the older Hargrove, battling the unforgiving chill of a frozen wilderness to inspect a crash site? when Miller, younger and just as competent, was readily available. This puzzle, too, would soon find its missing pieces. We split into two groups for the helicopter ride to the crash site, a journey surprisingly brief. I found myself alongside Hargrove, Miller, O'Connor, Harris, and Sawyer. In the other aircraft were Campbell, who stepped up to second-in-command with Miller accompanying us, Parker, Sanchez, Taylor, Davis, and Bennett plus our two pilots. Hargrove, always a man of few words, commanded respect and fear in equal measure. But as we crested the final ridge and the crash site came into view, a marked change overtook him. Bathing in the silvery glow of the moon, the Alaskan night unveiled a monstrous cylindrical object, its dark gray form shrouded in raging flames. It lay in a snow-laden clearing, flanked by a silent congregation of trees and a frozen pond. Its size was comparable to a 747, yet it lacked any discernible wings or propulsion system. I initially took it for a plane or maybe some experimental craft from us, or perhaps the Russians. Yet Hargrove's transformation upon seeing it suggested a different tale. Sawyer broke the uneasy silence with a half-joke. That's a big-ass plane. Hargrove met his comment with a venomous glare allowing the thumping rhythm of the propellers to fill the space until he spat out, Yeah, I wish it was a plane. Once we had touched down, a tacit understanding passed among us. None dared voice it aloud, but we knew what we were here to do. Hargrove's orders were clear and stern. He ordered us to approach the mysterious object with weapons at the ready. The flames encircling it gradually subdued under the biting cold of the Alaskan wilderness. With a firm voice, Hargrove called us to a halt when we were deemed close enough, and that's when we noticed him, a solitary figure advancing towards us, his hands raised in a gesture straddling surrender and peace. Hargrove's annoyance, already simmering since our arrival, was exacerbated by this stranger's presence. Do y'all even know what in the hell this even is? The stranger had the audacity to ask. Hargrove cast his eyes downward, shaking his head before approaching the man. With a sickly sweet smile, he inquired, what exactly did you see here this evening, sir? Despite the chill, 
Sweat glistened on Hargrove's forehead. The bystander merely pointed to his nearby home and reported hearing the crash. Throughout this account, Hargrove maintained eye contact, his nodding and smiling betraying his inner thoughts. This became clear when Hargrove responded, That's not the answer I was looking for, my friend. Before the stranger could respond, confusion writ large on his face. Hargrove drew a pistol and shot him four times in the chest. We stood, shocked yet comprehending, as an innocent man's life was snuffed out. Hargrove had just performed an execution, a cold testament to procedure and the preservation of the greater good. Sawyer clarified for any who didn't understand, no one is to find out about what happened or what would have happened here tonight unless you are asked about it by your superiors. Or else you may end up like this man who tragically died in a hunting accident a minute ago. None of us were greenhorns. We understood that obedience was paramount, regardless of the circumstances. Hargrove's voice sliced through the tense silence, ordering us to examine the crashed object. It had fragmented upon impact, with no parts remaining connected. We entered through a breach closest to what seemed like the front. Inside was an awe-inspiring sight straight out of a science fiction movie. Walls of the extensive control room were lined with unknown technology and inscrutable script. Then my eyes landed on two slumped humanoid forms. They were roughly five feet tall, thin, with pale gray skin and long limbs. On seeing them, Miller couldn't help exclaiming, Wow, wouldn't you know it, it's goddamn E.T.'s parents. Hargrove managed a caustic reply before contacting the helicopter pilot through his radio. He informed the base about the Code Red Level 5 situation and asked for immediate backup. Hargrove ushered us deeper into the ship and we continued our investigation. Toward the back, we found a room segmented into various areas, and there we found another body. However, this one was gruesomely disfigured, with a gaping hole drilled straight through its torso. Jesus Christ, what happened to that one? Campbell gasped. It looked as if someone had skewered it with a lamppost, hurling it like a javelin. The room featured two large chambers made of different materials, suggesting some sort of containment cells. Harris, investigating a rupture in the ship, called Hargrove over. Upon inspecting it, a wave of dread washed over Hargrove. Oh my good lord, he breathed. Curious, we moved closer to see what had alarmed him, a trail of massive circular footprints leading away from the ship and into the nearby woods. The grim reality hit us simultaneously. Whatever had been confined within one of those cells had broken free upon crash landing. It had slain the unfortunate creature in the room before fleeing into the Alaskan wilderness. The most daunting realization of all, it was up to us to hunt it down. Harris and O'Connor were the fortunate ones assigned to wait for the response crew at the crash site, while Hargrove, Miller, and the rest of us ventured into the unknown to hunt down whatever had escaped from that ship. The nature of our mission was a gray area. We weren't sure whether we were to capture the creature or terminate it on site. We were, without question, stepping into the unknown, tracking a captive of an extraterrestrial ship. Compared to the bright expanse of the crash site, the forest seemed impenetrably dark. The thick canopy blocked the faint moonlight, leaving us reliant on the dim beams of our rifle-mounted flashlights. We moved tactically, following the strange tracks, each man attuned to the task at hand. I found solace in the knowledge that these were no rookies. The men accompanying me were the best soldiers Fort Greeley could assemble, selected for this task because they could handle the unthinkable, even if it were the stuff of nightmares. We soon found ourselves staring into the vast mouth of a cave bored into a mountainside, the tracks leading directly into it. Hargrove unholstered his sidearm, motioning us to stay alert. Stay sharp, men. Miller, you're on point. The rest of us follow suit. The cave was a labyrinth of compartments and tunnels, but we continued on, driven by a grim determination. That is, until Miller halted us with a muttered, Good Lord. A grizzly bear, easily weighing around 600 pounds, lay slumped, eerily reminiscent of the creature in the ship's cell. An unsettling realization dawned on us. We were hunting a creature that had brutally overpowered a full-grown grizzly bear. Davis, voicing the fear simmering within all of us, suggested a swift retreat. Hargrove, however, swiftly rebuked his apprehension, reminding us of our duty and the importance of our mission. Regaining our resolve, 
we split up to investigate the network of tunnels branching from the main cavern. Hargrove took Bennett, Sawyer, and me down the central tunnel, while Miller led Taylor and Davis down the right, and Campbell took Parker and Sanchez down the left. Our exploration was cut short when the sound of gunfire echoed through the cave, followed by screams. We rushed back to the main compartment where Miller and his team were waiting. The gunfire came from Campbell's direction, Miller stated. Without wasting a moment, Hargrove commanded me to lead the way toward Campbell's position, his voice strained with suppressed tension. The sight of Sanchez huddled against the cave wall, attempting to stay hidden, was our first hint that something had gone horribly wrong. Sanchez sprang up at our approach, gesturing for silence. But the moment Hargrove blurted out his demand for an explanation, chaos erupted. A gigantic creature, resembling a praying mantis, lunged from the shadows, skewering Sanchez and hurling his body at us. In the ensuing melee, I witnessed fully armed, seasoned soldiers, the apex of Earth's food chain, being massacred by this alien monstrosity. With instinct taking over, I turned and ran, the chilling image of our defeat seared into my memory. As it turns out, we may rule this planet, but the creature we were up against didn't hail from our world. I followed the panic-stricken soldiers who had managed to escape the cave. Guided by sheer terror and a rush of adrenaline, we ran till we reached the crash site. There, the cleanup crew from the base, along with additional reinforcements, had already started their work. Among them, another superior from Fort Greeley was leading a separate team to locate our missing group. Of our original crew, only myself, Miller, and Davis remained. There had been a fourth, but in the pandemonium, we lost track of him. Barnes, the leader of the reinforcement, asked, What happened to Hargrove and the rest of your group? Miller, mustering his wits, managed to reply, They're all gone, sir. Something, something from that ship got them, and we couldn't stop it. Barnes processed the information, then asked, And where is this creature now, Miller? Miller's response was terse. It happened in a cave. That's where we left it. Barnes nodded, then issued a new narrative. Gentlemen, on this night, the 17th of April, 2003, you were at the base when an accident took the lives of Hargrove and the others. The circumstances were such that we could not retrieve their bodies. Do you understand? We nodded in agreement. It was over for them and for us. Upon returning to Fort Greeley, we were interrogated by our superiors and sworn to silence. The official story was that an accident, possibly a fuel tank explosion, had caused the loss of our comrades. I carried this burden for years, compelled to bury the truth for my own sanity. Then one day, some colleagues pulled me aside and shared what had transpired after our harrowing escape. Barnes had ordered an extensive sweep of the cave and the surrounding area, this time with a far more substantial force. What they discovered was disturbing. The fourth member of our escape party, identified as Bennett, was found impaled on a tree, his body having hit with such force that the tree had fallen. The creature's tracks led away from the scene, disappearing into the wilderness. Within the cave, the remains of Hargrove, Campbell, Sanchez, Parker, Taylor, and Sawyer were recovered, their bodies shredded beyond recognition. Our bullets seemed to have had no effect on the creature. It simply continued its massacre, unstoppable. Having now exited the military, settling into a quieter existence, time has allowed for reflection and a resolve to break the silence. The truth has grown in me, a nagging force pushing against the walls of my conscience. To ensure my family's safety and my anonymity, I've employed various methods to make my identity challenging to trace. A public library's computer became my shield, in a state far removed from my home. My intention is to make you aware of the reality that's been shrouded in secrecy and official narratives. Take this information and weigh it with care for the creature. That relentless, horrifying entity from the ship is still at large. Its whereabouts are unknown, its capabilities unfathomable. Only one certainty remains. It's out there somewhere.